My name is Vahid Chitsos, part of Elite Mastermind Group. Go ahead and introduce yourself to everybody. Let us know where you're tuning in from. All right. Well, hi, my name is Frank Buck, and I come to you from just outside Birmingham, Alabama. Awesome. Awesome. So I got some serious questions for you when it comes to organization, and I know you have done extensive amount of work on this topic, but if someone asks you, I want to get organized, where would you tell them to start? I have an idea, but I figured you're the expert in that field, and I'm going to wait for the answer. Okay. As far as where to start, let's start with a clean desk. Let's get rid of all of the paper from everywhere. And I've got a little trick to help people do it, and it's something I learned from my dad when I was eight years old. It's called the tickler file. I'm going to just reach down here and grab tomorrow's file. It has the number 10 on it. 31 files, 1 through 31. I've got paper laying on my desk. I, I need to take this to a meeting next Tuesday. I need to return this book to the library a week from Thursday. Instead of it sitting all over my desk, hoping I see it at the right time, when do I want to see this paper, piece of paper again? Drop it in the file for the appropriate day. And guess what? I earn a very important right, the right to forget about it. Let the system do the remembering. So, my desk is clean, and the paperwork comes back exactly what I need it. That is totally cool. You know, we got to make an app that does that for you. Take a picture, put it on that day, and that's it. Be done with it. So you're old school. I love it. You're old school. I love it. But if I flip well, yeah, the camera yeah. over, you'll be embarrassing how my folders, I mean, I'm still, <laughs> it, it doesn't have a specific date to it. Maybe that's my challenge, and I got to put a date to it. But it's just like the files and papers that I'm working on. But I got to tell you, I've seen some crazy desks and tables. So I kind of feel good because comparing to them, I feel like I'm very organized. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's the thing that will get your desk clean. And, you know, it, it's an old school tool that still works because we still all have the paper. But then I've taken and adapted that basic idea for everything else in my life. I have a digital task list. So when do I want to see this task? Ah, next Tuesday? Give it a date for next Tuesday. It's out of sight. It's out of mind until the date that I want to see it to come back. So we've got paper and digital input in our lives. So we need a paper and a digital solution. I love it. I love it. So let's talk about books, self-help books. What, what do you recommend to people? What is your method of getting that? Gosh, self-help books. There, there are. God, there, there's so many out there. I tell you, the the one that I want to recommend, if if I can uh, put in a little plug for myself, um, wrote a little book called "Get Organized: Time Management for School Leaders." That I just I just happen to have a copy right here. And you don't have to be a school leader. You don't have to be a principal to use this book because we're all dealing with paperwork, we're all dealing with email, we're all dealing with voicemail. So it's a, it, give, it gives you a system. Uh, and of course, I, I've read all the time management books that are out there, uh, Getting Things Done by David Allen. Um, my very favorite one from years ago, back in the daytimer uh, days uh, before the turn of the millennium, an old book called Time Power. And I loved it because it was so well written. And I thought, gosh, if we could do something for the digital age along that line. So that was a lot of the inspiration behind the book that, that I wrote. So is your background in teaching education and, and schooling, is that what it is? Yes, I actually, I started my career as a, a junior high band director. And actually behind me are some of that kind of memorabilia. Uh, I was a junior high band director for 12 years. And then I went into school administration and it was there with writing a dissertation, which was on time management, study of time management practices of Alabama principals. That's what really kind of thrust me into doing the research on time management on putting together a little workshop for principals and for teachers. And then he just grew from there. So after a successful career in school administration at age 50, I decided I still got a lot of energy in me. Uh, let me give 
another career a chance to grow some legs. So that's when I went into the time management organization productivity space. So as you can well imagine, a lot of my work is with school systems, speaking at education conferences, but I've worked with insurance people, with lawyers, with uh, magazine executives. I mean, you name it, because we're all dealing with being overwhelmed by the paper and the digital things in our lives. Love it, love it. As a, I have so much respect for teachers because they got to get things done. Like those periods, they just come and they go, they got to get the kids through and all that stuff. So I have a lot of respect. But I got to tell you, do you feel, I mean, you definitely got some age over us. And, and I always like to pick those people's because I didn't know how it was back then. And, and even mm -hmm. myself, even the, the new generation don't even know that the things that I went through and I'm not that even that old. So every decade, I feel like it goes through a change. I'm really seeing it that education is going to go online and we're going to be able to consume and give our students what they need and cut the fat out. Is that mm -hmm. what you see? Because I feel like in high school, I took a lot of classes that were important, but they didn't necessarily help me in what I wanted to get done. What is your opinion as far as, like, is there a lot of politics? Is there a lot of, I, what's the reason that education system is so slow to move and get with the, the trends that are going? Well, back when I was in college, one of the best professors I had, it, it, this was a course on sort of the history of education. And he says, as we go through this course, I want you to remember two things. Number one, throughout the history of education, schools tend to reflect the societies in which they're found, and schools tend to lag behind the societies in which they're found. So in a very digital age, you can expect schools going more and more that way, but throughout the history of education, we're going to be bringing up the rear. Now, i tell you what, what is, has thrown us light years ahead, and that's the present situation in which we live. Where I live, kids went home one day and never came back. Never came back. And over virtually overnight, teachers went to, we're going to have to do this thing online. So let's build the plane as we're flying it. And I don't know what school's going to look like in the fall, but we've learned a lot. Education has learned a lot. And, you know, if that third grade teacher in Birmingham, Alabama can deliver that lesson digitally to those kids in Birmingham, Alabama, that same teacher could deliver that lesson to people all over the world. And likewise, somebody from somewhere else could deliver that lesson to her kids in Birmingham, Alabama. So we may become more collaborative when we're not all having to go to the same spot to a school 10 minutes away with a teacher who lives 10 minutes from the school. When delivery can be from anywhere, we may see some big differences. Now, I don't think it's going to replace face-to-face -face because there is so much to be said for that. But I think we're going to become more efficient with how we handle things. And I think we're going to see a different world. I think we're going to see a better world. And I think we're going to see it a whole lot quicker because of this pandemic that we have all been through. I mean, my question is, why do, why do we need a pandemic? Why do we need so much? Why does something, I don't want to call it bad, but it is bad. I mean, a lot of people are losing their lives. And a lot of business owners have lost their business or they got to mm -hmm. adapt. A lot of families are going through challenges, all types of challenges that some of, most of them I wouldn't even know and I probably wouldn't even be able to comprehend. But why do we need to wait? And that's where I want to find out is based on your experience. Like, let's just say an entrepreneur like myself, I can't change the whole world. I can't change U.S. I can't change California. I, I sure as hell can't change even L.A. County. I'm just saying... The school two blocks down from me. What can I do as an individual to help these kids to get that opportunity to be exposed to the real world and what's going on so they get to pick what they want to do without going to get a degree for something that they may not 
really have the passion for. I feel like we have so many, like I want to know where is the system broken so I could be an assistant or help. Or if I can't do it, get somebody that could do it to do it. So if I'm not the right person, I'm all like, it's cool. It doesn't have to be me, but I can get the X, Y, Z to go and help that. And I, I haven't been able to find that. I, I just can't, I haven't been able to find that. Yeah, I think as a country, we have got to simply say, internet access is a basic human right. And it doesn't matter what your zip code is, we've got to have it. See, we, we have been battling this question for, well, well over 10 years. I, I remember as a principal, I've been retired from public education since 2009, but I remember way back then, I was saying we've got to reframe the question of which students have internet access and reframe that question to how does the student have internet access? Do they have it in their home? Can they go to the, to the library two blocks away? Can at their local church at the, at the McDonald's? Because as long as we say, well, we can't do these digital things because not all of the kids have the internet. It's not fair. So here's your pencil and paper worksheet. See, I think that's where we're stuck. Now, there are pockets of excellence. There are places where um, a teacher in a community where all the kids have internet access somewhere, some way, may do things what, like what, what's been called the flipped classroom. And this concept has been with us now for, for quite a while, where instead of the teacher standing up delivering a lesson and then the students go home to practice that we go home, we watch a demonstration of this learning done by our teacher or maybe somebody thousands of miles away who really did it well. And then we come back to school the next day and with the teacher right there beside us, we practice what we learned last night. It's called the flip classroom and, and it, it, it's, it's wonderful. But we've got to have everybody with that kind of access, nobody left out. So, you know, what can a local business do? You know, one, we've all got these phones that, you know, we get a new phone every couple of years. Well, what do we do with the old one? You know, it's sitting in a drawer somewhere. Well, you know, we don't have a data plan on it anymore, but that phone can still get on Wi-Fi. Those old tablets can still get on Wi-Fi. Let's donate those things to schools. And, you know, that, that little kid can take that phone, go down to the nearest Target and log on to their Wi-Fi. Go to McDonald's, log on to their Wi-Fi. Or go anywhere in town for a town that says, we're going to put this whole town under Wi-Fi. Anywhere you go in our city, you're going to be able to connect to the Internet. And when we get that serious, we may just see something great happen. I love it. That's a fantastic idea. As you were just saying that, I noticed I probably have at least a couple of phones that are older, but they could just be updated. It's not a big deal, but you are absolutely right. We can yeah. delete our, erase our data and just put it on Wi-Fi, and they'll be able to have access to that. Now, I don't know yeah. in L.A., I don't know that many kids, or it could just be I'm misinformed or I haven't seen it. I don't know that many kids that don't have a phone or, or, or that capability, but I am pretty sure there are people around us in cities that might just be maybe a little bit further down that they will need that. So here's my question for you. Why do we not, like, I don't understand. Whenever I look at the numbers, there's a lot of money being pumped into our education system. But if you look at it as a domino effect and we take the upper side of the funnel and the money is trickling down, I don't see that money in the classrooms. It's mm -hmm. not, it, you know, when we look at the, when we look at the billions that are being pumped into it, when I still show up to the classrooms, it still looks like from like 15, 20 years ago and they haven't got any upgrades. Like you see a little, you know, a little nice TV, you see one nice laptop, but then overall, it doesn't equate to, to the amount of money going in. So, listen, I'm just confused when it comes to this. I'm a simple guy. I'm on like billions of dollars. Why is that? Here? So, I don't know what happens in between. It's, you know, I, I, I wish I had the answer to it as well. Um, uh, a lot of money is spent on 
special education, and it has never been funded fully from Washington. Washington gives the mandates and says, figure it out on your own. Um, you know, we've got situations where, say, a student with, some, with special needs has a full-time aide. So there's a whole salary with benefits and so forth uh, for a person to stay with one student. And so that kind of cost, uh, you know, builds up, you know, very, very greatly. Uh, there's a lot of paperwork that, and, and a lot of money being spent on collecting data and this and that. There's a lot of time and effort spent on testing where, you know, schools just have to close down for several days for the kids to take a high stakes test where you pretty much know the results before the kids ever take the test. Um, Which is crazy you know, to me that they it, it, it the is. numbers before. That's crazy. Yeah. That defies the whole purpose of they already know what the numbers are going to be. Why not work on it and go based on that assumption saves ourselves three or four days. So here, here I got another question. You mentioned five keys to peace of mind. Can we elaborate yeah. on that a little bit? Tell us, I mean, peace of, listen, to me, peace of mind is, you know, my wife not getting on my case. That's a, <laughs> that's a peace of mind. Is that the key number one? Are you going to, is that number one or is that number two? <laughs> well, now it actually has a lot to do with, you know, your wife told you to do something, but you know what happens? You think, I'll do that. I can remember that. That's easy. Yeah. Take out the garbage. I can remember to do that. But then you get involved in something else, and you forget to take out the garbage. That's and then true. she's all over you. She says a simple thing like take out the garbage, and you yeah. mess that up. How can you mess that up? Well, so, but if when she said take out the garbage, you somehow threw that in a system. Now, what's the system look like? The system may be a pocket memo pad where you jot that down and then you earn the right to forget about it. Or on the other end of the spectrum, it might be to talk to the Google home sitting across the room. Uh, you know, okay, Google remind me to take out the trash. It goes into your digital list. You look at your list. Oh, let me go take out the trash now. Uh, so the ability to throw it in the system is what gives me the peace of mind. I've got all kinds of things I'm going to be doing the rest of the day but I have the freedom to not have to think about any of them. So that the only thing I'm thinking about right now is me and you carrying on this conversation and making it something that people will enjoy tuning into and hopefully will motivate them and, and at least give them a clue that maybe there's an easier way to work and play. I love that. So, okay. So out of the five, what was that? That was the number one? Write it and, and, and forget well, it. Let me just, we'll, we'll, we'll run through the five. The five, and I kind of touched on this one earlier, working from a clean desk. And the tickler file does that. So you get the paper out of the way, it shows up when you need it. Number two, to have what I call a signature tool. Now, if you had seen me 20 years ago, I would have said, here's my day timer. This is my signature tool. Every place I need to be, everything I need to do, all the people in my life, the notes that I want to have from everywhere, they're in this book. This book goes with me. Boom. That's kind of like my brain. And now it's a digital system. Computers sync to my phone, but I'm going to have Google Calendar. They're the places I need to be. I use Remember the Milk as my digital task list. They're the things I need to do. Google Contacts. They're the people in my life. Uh, Evernote for the notes that I want to have from everywhere. And Gmail sort of is the hub of all the communication. So to have that signature tool. So what I don't have are all these little sticky notes and little scraps of paper and writing things on my hand and hoping I'll remember other things. No, throw it in the system, let the system remind you. So that's key number two. Key number three, and this sort of comes from my background in education, handling repeating tasks, putting those on autopilot. You know, I don't care what your job is. We all have those things that we have to do every week, every month every year and the hard part is not doing those tasks the hard part is remembering to do them so uh you know i got my tag renewed last year need to have it again this 
Well, what's going to happen in February if I don't happen to think about that? So just getting really good at going, I'm going to put that on my list. Oh, I'm not going to just do that one time. That's an every year in mid-February. And in your repeating task, in your task manager, remember the milk in my case, put the task in there, say it repeats every February 16th. And then you're not having to worry about what you forgot. Uh, the fourth is... Managing the flood of incoming information. You may start the day organized. Here's my list of what I'm going to do. But then the phone starts ringing. Emails coming in. People are knocking at the door. So how quickly can you throw those things in a system so that you can keep working on what it was you wanted to be working on and feel handling multiple projects? The ability to say, let me tag you what all my projects are. Here they are. And more importantly, here's where we are on each and every one of those. To move this project forward, it's a phone call to Bob. To move this one forward, it's an email I need to write. Plus all of the supporting information about that project, that it's there's a, a little notation of what paper folder or digital folder or what note in the attached note to that task you have. So that again, it's all there in the system. You have a system, and you just work the system. So that's what I call the five keys. That's what I teach in my book. That's what I teach in coaching calls and live workshops. And, and here's the thing. People come away going, that's so easy. Why didn't I think of that before? It's easy not to do. And, that's and, what and it's, no, it, it, it's in. And see, the thing is, it has to be easy. I, I, I once saw a, a, a statistic. It, it was how many pounds of popcorn in the United States were consumed like in the year 1980? And then I saw the same statistic for 1990, and it was double, double. Well, our population didn't double. What happened? Microwave popcorn. Making popcorn became easier so therefore, we, we did more. I'm a firm believer that what is easy gets done. So we just got to set this whole thing up so it's easy. Wow. No, I mean, I love it. The way you explain now, I think about it. Why did I, where have you been all these years? We need to get your book into other people's hands. We need to do a couple of sessions on this because this, now that I realize, I'm all like, I could literally cut down a lot of my stuff that, it's just lingering. I could just put in a calendar and just knock them all down in one day and just be done with it. So I don't, it allows me to forget about it. That's, that's the beautiful part of it. So here's my question. Here's my question. When you're a teacher, principal, or you work in an environment like that, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like the amount of fires you need to put out is on the same realm. It's in the same work. Uh, kind of a design, look, feel, uh, kind of same realm. But when you're an entrepreneur, when you're running a small business, let's just say small, not a Fortune 500, a small business with four or five employees, the tasks and fires that you need to put out, I feel like they vary. You got marketing, you got customer support, you got emails, vendors, you got inventory, you got a lot of stuff. So when they come at you, how do you, I feel like, how do you tell the employee to hold on? I got something on my calendar. I got to get this done before I get to, Like, that's a little bit weird. Like, how does that conversation go? Yeah. Well, of course, all of us firefighting at, at some point. Uh, and as a school principal, you know, there's a lot – especially say that your your middle school assistant principal boy sometimes that can be your five a firefighter all day every day you're handling discipline you're handling the water fountain just exploded on the seventh grade hall it, oh it, it it's almost like it, it can be like the the cashier at the grocery store going next next that you don't feel like you're getting anything accomplished you're just sitting back ready for the next crisis to come really? along so I, I think one thing that you can do is have somebody that handles those so if you're a principal and maybe you have several assistant principals that one of them their job sort of is handling all the fires and crises or somehow delegating some you know some of that out 
when the CEO, so the principal of the school, or the, or in, in your case, the owner of the business, when you're doing that all all day every day, you know, no, nothing, nothing can move forward. When you're doing a lot of firefighting, stepping back and looking at the system, because a lot of times you can see that we're getting a lot of this kind of problem. Why is that? So often it breaks down to communication, that the word is just not getting out to people, or the word is getting out in a very fragmented way. You know, it's random emails here and there. And your ability to communicate through email is really dependent upon the other person's ability to handle email on their end. So, for instance, as a principal, instead of just sending out random little emails, I just sort of saved everything up, and then every Friday, here's everything my faculty needs to know for the next week in one nice, neat, it used to be a paper memo, and then overnight we switched to a blog post when, when blogging was first coming in. Now, we didn't do the paper memo and the blog to give you this or this or this or this. No. One place to look for everything. If you look there, you got everything. If you didn't look there, you missed everything. And it was simple and teachers appreciated it. And they and you know, I think universally, if you asked my teachers what they liked about me, they'd say two things. He's organized. And communication was really good. I always knew what was going on. Yeah, and, and I think for any business to be successful, anytime any project that I've done that I've gone down to shit, uh, the number one contributor was communication. And that was predominantly my my issue, my challenge, my shortcoming with the communication because a lot of times I have this challenge where I assume that they know. Mm -hmm. So every time I assume that they knew, they didn't know, and then just caused other problems. So I feel like communication is a big deal when it comes to that. And and obviously that's very important if you're, if you're a principal. So what is it that you loved about being a principal? Because I got to tell you, in my school, principal was not the most favorite person. And mm -hmm. they had many, many names that I don't think I can mention here. <laughs> so how did you deal with it? I mean, you must be like, you're, you, you're, you gotta be tough skin to, 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 to be a principal. That is not a easy task. I hope they paid you well. Well, you know, if, if you look at what a principal makes and how many people that they supervise, you know, in the private sector, someone who supervised that many people and then if you look at how many students there are and counted those people uh principals are very 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 underpaid and when i became a band director i thought i would never want to be a principal i would never want that headache but i had two 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 men two principals in my life my very first principal first of all a man named harry anderson who was a who was a great supporter you know if you were right he supported you. If you were wrong, he supported you. And then he would have that private conversation with you. So I, I was never hesitant to make a decision because somebody might not like it and complain. I knew he had my back. And I took that, that trait with me when I became a principal. And second was a guy by the name of Henry Clark. He was another principal I had. This was a high-performing middle school. And when he came to us and I saw the difference one person with a vision could make, I, I rethought it. I enjoyed every day as a principal. And I think I had good kids. Um, it was good community. It, it was a good faculty. They were very experienced teachers. And they were good enough, I could let them teach. And I think that's another strength. I, I, I didn't want to go in and be the teacher. I wanted to give them the support so that they could be the best teacher they could and remove the roadblocks. You know, you didn't come in my building and say, I'm going to go down and give that teacher a piece of my mind. No, that's not going to happen. Come on in here. Let's you and I have a talk. And if need be, 
We'll make a call to the police department to escort you out. But no, you're not going to go down to that teacher's classroom. And no, we're not going to call the teacher up to the office unexpected for you to sit down and chew them out. No, let you and I discuss the problem. I'll talk to the teacher. And then if we need to get you and the teacher together, sure, we can. But we're going we're gonna to treat each other with dignity and respect. And that is just the way it's going to be. Now, does everybody like that? No, no. Everybody wants their way. But I think if you've got a vision for what you want your school to look like, you've got a vision for how you want your kids to feel and how you want your teachers to feel, it makes doing the right thing the easiest thing. I agree with that 100%. That communication level and having that support, I think, I mean, I feel like that will work in any situation or any or any mm-hmm. any organization, military, army, air force, school, business, Fortune 500, a household. They're relying on a heavily duplicatable, um, predictable infrastructure and system. It's got to have that. Every family has got a routine of when they have dinners or typically what, what time they have dinners or what they do on the weekends or w- when they go to church, when they do. So I think having those little small subsystems, having that, it makes, it just gives you a peace of mind and it, it just makes things to go. Is you can, you don't have to be anxious to know what's coming up. You kind of expect what's happening. So I, mm-hmm. I love that. So if you have and, one, and I, I, I want to throw another word in there, tradition. Systems relate to tradition, those things that you can count on that become important to a people, and and they feel like when times are a little bit uncertain, that they're things that we can count on. I agree with that 100%. How do people find you? How do they find your book? Well, tell us a little bit about that. Okay. Easiest thing. Just remember my name, Frank Buck dot org there's my website so the first thing i would encourage people to if if you like what you're hearing and and you you really you like the nuts and bolts and you want more just go there and get on my mailing list now i i don't i don't spam people you hear from me one time a week every tuesday you get a little email from me but Couple of gifts you get right off the bat. First is my little ebook on how to get your desk clean. So it really goes into the particular part, just how to set it up, how you can have it for free today. And then second, a couple of days later, you get a little ebook on how to use Remember the Milk, how to do the one-time settings, how I use mine, get it up and going. And then every week, just a little short email of what I'm doing, some tips to help you get organized. And uh, then, you know, if you really like what you hear and what you see, there's information on uh, how to get hooked up with me for I do one-on-one coaching. And I tell people, if I have not come to your organization to speak, it's for one reason. You haven't asked me. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's the best. And and give us the name of the book one more time. Your book. The name of the book is Get Organized, Time Management for School Leaders, awesome. second edition. Love it. Listen, I want to thank you so much for taking this time out of your busy schedule and being with us this morning. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we can do a couple of more videos because I, I have way more questions to ask on our adventure. But I want to go to the site. I want to check it out first. I want to get more information, and then that will create more questions for me, and then you and I are going to have a community. And then listen, throughout this process, if you need any help from me or my team, let us definitely know. I'll do it. Thanks yeah. again for having me. This, this was fun. Love it. Thank you so much for being here. Stay safe. Bye, everybody. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.